You know, I want to look at the question as we study the book of Joel today. I want to look at the question of why do plagues take place? You know, we can ask, and it's a common question, and it's a hard question to answer, but it's certainly a question that we recognize is in this world. Why do bad things happen? And we know that we live in a world of sin, that God created a perfect world. He created a perfect world with no death. Jesus said, as he described the field that was sowed with wheat, and then an enemy comes and sows into it tares. And they ask the owner of the field, we sowed good seed. Where did the tares come from? And Jesus said, an enemy has done this. And then he says that the enemy is the devil. We know that the problems in the world today are because a thief has broken in, told the devil to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The destruction, the problems that we have come from the devil. But the irony of it is that God can even work in the midst of tragedy. And I believe the book of Joel teaches us that very well. You know, why do plagues take place? We're in the midst of a plague. Coronavirus, we know, has halted life as we know it. Currently, five million, over five million confirmed cases worldwide. Well, in the book of Joel, they were not dealing with a plague, a virus like that, but they have had a plague nonetheless. It's a plague that we still have today. It was a plague of locusts that came to them. And currently, the eastern horn of Africa is in this very problem right now. Some say that they've never seen locusts as thick as what are now in eastern Africa, the Middle East, and approaching all the way to India. And it's a serious situation because these countries are dealing with coronavirus, but now they are dealing with more locusts than they've ever seen. Locusts are very much like a grasshopper that go into a swarming phase. And in some areas, 100% of the crops have been destroyed. In other areas, the locusts are so thick that aircraft have had to divert because there were too many locusts to land in the locust infestation. It's right in this area here. This is from several months ago. It's only gotten worse since then. But Ethiopia and Somalia, Kenya, Eicheria, that area has been hit the hardest. But over in the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula, going over to Iran and Pakistan and India. And there's major concern about this. Some places in Iran, they said they sprayed the locusts and they came up with six inches thick of locusts. You can imagine what a problem that would be. And so this is very similar to what we're finding in the book of Joel. Because in the book of Joel, we don't have a lot of information, historical background or things like that about Joel. Probably prophesied for Judah, probably sometime maybe the 7th, 8th century BC. Now, Joel is a fascinating book when we look at it. He has, some have said that Joel has the strength of Micah, the tenderness of Jeremiah, the vividness of Nahum and the sublimeness of Isaiah. It's also a very prophetic book. Peter quotes the book of Joel in the book of Acts as referring to the last days. And so we're going to look at Joel. We're going to look at it from its historical perspective, and we're also going to look at it from prophetically as well. So let's turn to the book of Joel, Joel chapter 1 to begin with. And here in Joel 1, verses 3 and 4, Notice how it describes it here. Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children. 
and their children another generation. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. Now notice, Joel begins here, and the Lord is speaking and says, let your children tell them about it. Tell your children's children about it. This is a plague of mammoth proportions, a locust plague that invades and destroys the land. Notice what it says, what the chewing locust leaves, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust leaves, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust leaves, the consuming locust has eaten. Do you think there's anything left? Everything is pictured as virtually everything being destroyed. I can imagine if you're working in your garden and what the caterpillars have left, the flea beetles have eaten, and what the flea beetles have left, the squash bugs have eaten, and what the squash bugs have left, the birds came and ate, or whatever else. One thing after another, and there was nothing left. It was disaster that had struck. Now, I suppose we don't get the full picture of this, because when we garden, our food supply and livelihood is not generally at stake. We don't like it when the bugs eat the tomatoes or whatever else, but yet we can go to the store and we can buy some more food. But in this day and age, that was very difficult. Their garden, their fields, their crops were not only what they ate from, but it was also their means of livelihood. And if you have this locust and another locust and another one and another one that is consuming and destroying them all, this is a terrible catastrophe. We read in verse 12, and it gives the description of it here when we read through it, beginning in verse 8. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of the Lord. The priest mourn who minister to the Lord. The field is wasted. The land mourns and the grain is ruined. The new wine is dried up. The oil fails. Be ashamed, you farmers. Wail, you vine dressers, for the wheat and barley because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine has dried up and the fig tree has withered. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree and the trees of the field are withered. Surely joy has withered away from the sons of men. Catastrophic disaster here. The fields are gone. The land is gone. The grain is ruined. The new wine is dried up. There's no oil. Joy has withered away from the sons of men. And then when we look at it further, not only is there this locust plague that comes and devours everything, but it seems as if a drought follows after that. Verse 17. The seed shrivels under the clods. The storehouses are in shambles. Barns are broken down, for the grain has withered. How would the seed shrivel under the clods? There's no moisture to germinate it, right? You plant the seeds and it's under the ground, but nothing grows. a locust plague of such proportions that they had never seen before. A locust plague that the prophet said, tell your children, let them tell their children and the other generation as well. This is as bad as it gets. We go to chapter three. Now it could be, by the way, that he is describing there's, I believe there was a literal locust 
invasion that took place. He could also be metaphorically describing the invasions of the armies of either Assyria or Babylon as well. But notice the descriptions here. Verse 3, a fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. So what's the word picture here? The land before them is like the Garden of Eden. Would you expect the Garden of Eden to be verdant and beautiful? Beautiful gardens, green, lush. But then this plague comes and descends. And what does it say is after them? A desolate wilderness. Everything is devoured. Everything is destroyed. Notice it says here, verse 8, they do not push one on another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. They are pervasive. This swarms of locusts are everywhere. Not only are they in the fields, not only are they in the gardens, they're in the houses. They're everywhere. Have you ever had a swarm of locusts like that? I can remember. I don't remember what year it was, but I remember that there were some, not locusts like this, that were devouring like that. They were the circadia, I believe, at locusts. And it would be deafening sometimes from the noise that they would be making. And if you walked in the grass or in the woods, they would just be all over your pant legs just because they were everywhere. But they didn't devour everything like that. The picture that he's painting here is they're devouring everything and you can't get away from them. Not only are they in the fields, they're in your bedroom even. Disaster. Doesn't sound very good, does it? I want to make clear, God does not bring disaster. The devil is the one that brings destruction. But what's interesting about the book of Joel is that God claims this army as his. Notice that. Joel 1, verse 15. Joel 1, verse 15. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Destruction from the Almighty. Notice verse 11 of chapter 2. Joel Chapter 2, verse 11. The Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? And we see also in verse 25, so I will restore to you. This is talking about the restoration that's going to take place. But notice what he refers to it as. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army, which I sent among you. God says, this was my army that I sent among you. What does this mean? How or why would God send an army? Why would he claim this destructive plague of the locust as his? Sometimes God has to use a method to reach us and to teach us that he doesn't want to use. Do you ever say to your children, if you were going to give them a spanking? Doesn't make any sense to children. But did you ever say, this will hurt me more than it will hurt you? I don't know that that's the wisest thing to say because certainly children can't comprehend that. What? It's not going to hurt you more than it's going to hurt me. It's going to hurt me more.
But what does the parent mean? I'm going to bring some pain with the hopes of you avoiding worse pain in the future. And God uses that same analogy or that same idea here. He refers to Babylon as his battle axe. I don't believe that God is the one that brings disaster or brings destruction or brings heartache or pain. I believe that comes from the enemy that has done this, but God can use and God can allow these things sometimes. And why is he allowing it? Because many times the only way that we learn is the hard way. Have you ever noticed that? Somebody might say, you better not do this because a bad consequence happens. But we don't seem to believe it until we experience the consequence ourselves. It's kind of like we have a hard time understanding that fire burns unless we play with fire and learn that it burns ourselves. It's not the best way. It's not the way that God wants us to learn. He'd rather say, look, this is what I'm telling you. This is what's the best for you. Can you follow it? But sometimes God recognizes that the only way that he can reach us is through allowing disaster to strike. David said in Psalm 119, verse 71, it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I might walk in your way. And when we see the disaster that comes with this locust plague upon the nation of Judah here, God doesn't want there to be famine. God doesn't want the pain that it's going to bring about, but God desires their eternal salvation. And sometimes he knows that the eternal salvation is greater than the temporal pain that has gone through. And so he allows disasters to come. God prefers other methods, but a lot of times our heads are too hard for to learn the, through the methods that God wants us to learn. Now, in Joel, Peter claims this is a prophetic book. We know that from Acts chapter 2. And when we look at this locust plague, I believe it is prophetic of what will happen in the last days. Daniel refers to it in Daniel 12, verse 1. Jesus refers to it in Matthew 24 and other places that a time of trouble is coming. Such has never been. Does that sound pleasant? A time of trouble like there's never been since there was a nation. That doesn't sound pleasant. And when I look in the book of Joel, what I believe we're seeing are some of the, metaphorically speaking, some of the challenges, some of the difficulties that are going to come upon God's people in the last days, in this time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. When we look in the book of Revelation, the Bible talks about all the world will be united under one head against God's people. And we know as well from the book of Hebrews chapter 12, it says God wants a kingdom that cannot be shaken. There's going to be a shaking taking place in the last days of this earth's history, and it will even appear like God's people will fall. When you have an invasion after invasion after invasion of these various locusts in their various phases, and everything is destroyed, it looks like there's no possibility and no hope. But prophetically, why does God allow a time of trouble to come? We don't like trouble, do we? We don't like difficulties. We know that God loves us. And so we question if God loves us, why does he say there's going to be this time of trouble like there never has been before? Does God have something that we need to learn 
even in the last days, during these challenging times that are ahead? I believe he does. Is it easy to become comfortable here in this world? There are times like what we're living in right now with the pandemic going on. There are times that we lose that comfort. We understand that. But yet, even though we lose that comfort, it's easy to slip back into a comfortability, a schedule and enjoyment of things here. And I'm not saying we shouldn't enjoy life here. We should. God has told us that we are to enjoy what he's given us here. But... Too many times we become comfortable here and we think that this world is our home. Oh, we wouldn't say that. We would sing, I'm a pilgrim here. I'm a stranger here. We would sing these songs. We would acknowledge that. But too many times we live like this is our home. The book Great Controversy, page 621, talks about this time of trouble. Notice the description that it gives. It was necessary that our earthliness would be consumed. What is earthliness? Of this earth, isn't it? God sees that even in the very end, God is going to use even the calamities and the terrible things that happen, God will use them, but he won't bring them. He will use them to draw us to him and to prepare us to remove the earthliness from us that the universe can be eternally secure. We don't want to go through another great rebellion against God again. And so God uses Locusts. No, it won't always be locusts. Could be any other form of disaster that comes to us. But God will use it. Not because he wants to. But because he loves us. And he wants to spend eternity with us. In an eternally secure universe. Too many times when disaster strikes, what do we say? Too many times we say, where is God? Why did this happen to me? Have you ever said it before? I'm sure you have. I think we all have. And the children of Israel could have said the exact same thing in Joel's time. They could have said, why this locust? Why this disaster? Why is it coming? Notice the experience that God wanted to lead his people to. God allows disaster to lead to a greater deliverance. Let's go to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, and I really believe Joel 2, 12 and 13 are the center of the book of Joel. There's amazing things going on. We could spend a lot of time studying the book of Joel. There's Lots of allusions, not only to Acts, but to Revelation and to Daniel. I believe that Joel actually helps us understand Daniel chapter 11. But notice here the point, Joel 2 verse 12 to begin with. Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. What does God say? Turn to me with all your heart. You know, I'm amazed as we have been going through the Old Testament. We're going to be getting into the New Testament in a little while. But people get sometimes such a misconception of the Old Testament. People get the idea that the Old Testament is all about gloom and doom. They think that the Old Testament, God required them to legalistically do things I've been amazed again and again as we look at each of the books of the Old Testament. God is interested at the heart. It's heart religion in the New and in the Old Testament. 
And God is saying to his people here, yes, I'm allowing disaster to strike. I don't want it to. I love you. I want you to learn other ways, but I'm allowing it to strike so that you can turn to me, not with part of your heart, but that you can turn to me with all of your heart. I would say this is true repentance. Repentance is not something that is just for a new Christian. Repentance is something that I believe needs to grow in us each and every day. Why? Because repentance is a deep sorrow for our sin, a realization of our sinfulness and our unworthiness. The problem is, we think we're doing pretty good when we look around us. We think we're doing good when we see brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so, and we compare ourselves to them, we think that we're doing good. But guess what? Brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so are not the standard, are they? <laughs> when we look at them, whether however good or good they are not, it doesn't matter. When we look at them, we're looking the wrong way. We'll never have true repentance by looking horizontally. You know we must look vertically. And the more we look to Jesus, the more we look at what he has done, the more we look at his life, the more we're going to realize that our lives fall dismally short. And as we see Jesus, our repentance needs to deepen. Turn to me, he says, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. This is a repentance. You know, I really like the parable that Jesus gives in Luke chapter 17. It's only found in Luke chapter 17. It's only a few verses. And Jesus says, you know, if, if the master goes out and he comes in and there's a servant and the servant is prepares his meal, what is the servant going to do? Is he going to eat the meal? No. Is his master going to thank him? No. He says there in Luke chapter 17 and verse 10, fascinating passage here, one that I believe we need to remember more often than we do. He says, does the master turn and thank him? He says, no. Then verse 10, he says, so likewise, when you have done all the things that you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Why does Jesus say the servants are to say? Sometimes we think if we do these things that God asks us, we're doing good. And Jesus says, no, even if we do everything that the master tells us to, we are simply unprofitable servants. We've only done what our master has asked us to do. And God allows this disaster to strike in the form of a locust invasion and no deliverance from it in order that they might turn unto me with all your heart in deep repentance. Not half your heart, not part of your heart, not all of these things that we too often do. The Lord allows this destroying army to come so that we can learn not to have a divided heart. Notice verse 13. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Notice what he says here. Turn to me with all your heart, but not just turn to me with all your heart. What does he say? He says, rend your heart. What does rend your heart mean? Rend your heart, not your garments. Do you remember when Jesus was before the Sanhedrin? And he said, are you the son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. 
Hvad er det Caiaphas gjorde? He tore his garments. Blasphemy! What was he doing? He was rending his garments to make a show. Can people see when you've rent your garments? Yeah, people can see. Can people see when you rend your heart? That's an internal thing, isn't it? What is God saying here? Don't just go through the forms and the observances. Don't just honor me with your lips. The Lord's destroying army is to help correct this. It's true heart religion that the Lord desires. Rend your heart, not your garment. Turn wholeheartedly to me. And so the book of Joel pictures this invading army, this army of locusts devouring, destroying everything, disaster that strikes like they have never seen or experienced before. But then the Lord in the midst of this disaster says, look, I'm claiming it as my army. Not that I want the disaster. Not that I want you to be in pain. But I want you to live with me eternally. And you need to rend your heart. You need to turn to me with all of your heart. You know, in the physical world, If our heart is rent, is that a problem? In the physical world, we cannot live with a heart that is torn in two. I'm not saying a heart literally tears in two, but you know, get the idea. We can't live. But that's the point. We cannot live with our own selfish sin-polluted heart. It must be broken that Jesus can create in me a new heart of God. It's not enough to modify our life. It's not enough just to patch up our experience. Jesus says, your heart has to be rent. Who do I honor? Those that are brokenhearted. Because then I can give you a new heart. I can take the heart of stone out of your heart. I can rend it and make it a heart of flesh. And so disaster strikes, but God says, I'm wanting you to turn to me with deep repentance. I'm wanting you to recognize that total drastic heart change that you need. By the way, how often do we need that heart change? Is it enough to have it 20 years ago when we gave our heart to the Lord? Is that enough? We need to give our heart to the Lord whenever we have. And if we haven't given our heart to the Lord, we need to choose to do that right now. But it's not enough to just give our heart at one point in time. It's not enough to say I was saved on September 21, 1973 or whatever. This is an experience, a growing Deeper experience. Just like we have a deeper repentance every day, we have a deeper surrender and heart transformation every day as well. And God says, when disaster strikes, this is my purpose. This is my intent. I want you to serve me. I want you to turn fully to me. And when you do that, notice what he promises here. Let's look at the deliverance now. Disaster only brings about greater deliverance in God's plan if we respond the way that he desires us to. Notice Joel 2, verse 20. But I will remove far from you the northern army, and I will drive him away into a barren and desolate land with his face toward the eastern sea and his back toward the western sea. His stench will come up and his foul odor will rise Because he has done monstrous things. God says, I'm going to move that army. I'm going to blow this army into the sea. 
And then notice verse 23. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. I'm going to restore the rains that have been withheld from you. I'm going to deliver you. Deliverance comes to the nation of Judah here as they turn to him and deliverance comes to us as well. Notice we read this verse already, but let's read it again here. Verse 24, maybe we'll read 24 all the way to 27. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. That's exactly the opposite of what we'd seen in the earlier pictures, right? Before, they were empty. There was nothing. The seed was withering underneath the clods. But now there's a restoration. Notice verse 25. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be put to shame, then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. Oh, beautiful here. God is a God of restoration. He wants to restore the years that we've lost. You know, if we feel like we have lost years, lost time, God wants to restore those years. God wants to restore us. Joel predicts. Joel recognizes disaster strikes. He realizes the reason that God works through disaster sometimes to lead us to repentance and a fuller, deeper heart surrender to him. But then God says, I will restore to you. God is a God of restoration. And when God restores, he wants to make it even better than it was before. God has promised he is going to restore us. The nations that had been oppressing them, we come to chapter 3 of the book of Joel, and it turns to the nations and what God is going to do to them in Joel chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. God promises, not only will I remove the locust army, the rains will return, the crops will be restored, and the captivity and oppressing nations will be destroyed. God will deliver his people if we turn to him with a full heart. If we seek and say, Lord, I need my heart rent, not just my garments. I don't want to go through forms. That's not enough. And prophetically, when we look at this book, if we had time, we could paint the prophetic picture and see Armageddon in chapter 3 here of Joel and lots of things transpiring. But prophetically, God promises an outpouring of his spirit in the last days as well. And even though for a time it looks like God's people are about to fall, God triumphs gloriously through his people that have returned to him. God's people will ultimately be delivered. Until we come to chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. And Judah shall abide forever and Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will acquit them of the guilt of bloodshed, whom I had not acquitted. For the Lord dwells in Zion. God allows disasters to strike that we might be led to a deeper repentance and heart surrender to him. 
but God's ultimate plan is full and complete deliverance. The disasters and terrible things do happen in the world of sin in which we live. We live in a world that has been hijacked from our loving Creator. We live in a world that has joined rebellion against the God of heaven. And there are so many awful things that take place, not because God wants them, but because God is seeking to bring this to a complete and a restored universe. But even though awful things happen, how do we relate? We need to allow God to lead us to a deeper repentance and in a deeper way surrender our hearts to him. May disasters lead us to a deeper repentance and surrender to him. But there's something else that God wants to do. He doesn't bring the plagues. He doesn't bring the disasters. But there's something that God can do. God can turn disaster into a blessing. No, I don't know how he does it. And I don't know and I can't explain all of the workings of the Almighty. It's beyond me. But I know it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8, we can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. And I know that God, even when we face disaster, even when it seems like the entire world is falling apart around us, God can even work in these terrible disasters, not only to lead us deeper to him, but he can work in other ways as well. I would probably told the story before, but it's a story I really like of a family in, I believe it was in West Africa. And as this family was struggling to survive with their subsistence farming, they were growing their beans to sell, to be able to survive for the next six months or a year, whatever it was. And as they were doing this, they learned about the truths that we know. They started studying the Bible. They learned about Jesus and his desire for us to have that personal relationship with him. They learned of how he wants to spend a time with us each and every Sabbath day. They learned what a blessing it is to receive their tithe. And they stepped out in faith. And as the beans were a route ready to harvest, guess what came? A locust crowd descended from the north. From the Sahara Desert, this locust cloud arrived and landed on their beans just as they were ready to harvest and began devouring them. They ran about trying to stop them, trying to shoo them away, trying to beat them. But it was impossible because they had thousands and millions of locusts everywhere. And they watched as disaster had struck. And in their minds, they're asking, why God? We followed you. We prayed to you. We worshiped you. We sacrificed. We stepped out by faith to give you your tithe, your 10%. Why did this disaster come upon us? And all of a sudden, the mother had an idea. She ran out into the field and began scooping up those locusts. And the rest of the family looked on, thinking that she had gone crazy because of the stress of it all. Why was she scooping them up? There was nothing they could do. You couldn't collect them. There were millions of them. And she said, come join me. Let's get them. And finally, the others, the children and the husband and the others start running and they start collecting. They're not even sure what they're doing. And as the locust finally lift, There's their bean field. Nothing left. Every leaf gone from every bush and every tree. The beans devoured. Empty stems sticking up. And they've got 20-some bags of locusts now. 
And they turn to the mother and say, what are we going to do with all these locusts? Why did we gather them? And this may not seem very appetizing to us. But she said, people love to eat the locusts. We can't sell beans, but we can sell the locusts now. And they went into town and began frying up these locusts. By the way, locusts are clean according to the Bible as well. In case you want to try them, I don't recommend it, but they are clean. And they actually made more money and it was able to provide for the food of the village than if they would have harvested their beans and sold their beans. Disaster struck. But God can turn disaster into blessing. It's what he did in the book of Joel. And it's what he wants to do for us. Does it always look the same? No. Do I know how it's going to happen? No. But I know that God, when disaster strikes, says, turn unto me with all of your heart. And I don't know what disasters you might or might not be going through, but I'm certain that at some point we are going to face disasters in our lives. And when we face those disasters, let us not blame God. Let us recognize that it is not God that kills and steals and destroys. That's the devil that does that. But God can use disaster even if we turn to him with all of our heart. And not only can he use disaster to lead us to him, when disasters strike, God can even turn them into a blessing. And so as we think about God turning disasters into deliverance, let us remember that God is working still in every challenge we face, every difficulty that confronts us. God is working still. He's working to lead us to a closer, deeper, more heartfelt repentance. And he's seeking to even turn those disasters into a blessing somehow and some way. May we turn unto him with all of our heart and may we rend our hearts and not our garments. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you can even, when terrible disasters transpire, as they did in the book of Joel, that you can even turn it around for good. Lord, we don't understand that. We don't know how. But help us to believe that. When disaster strikes, when the locust plague descends, may we turn to you with all of our hearts. May we rend our hearts and not our garments. And may we trust that you are working still. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.